Welcome to the 11th episode of our podcast series for advisors considering the independent space. Today's episode is quasi-independence, the sophisticated independent model that offers the best of all worlds. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on wealthmanagement.com, as well as iTunes and other resources. While this podcast series is about going independent, the model that has gained almost as much traction is quasi-independence, one where the advisor is an employee, but of a firm that is independent-like. I'm including a discussion of it here because many advisors who explore full-on independence decide that it's just too much for them. It's too much of a leap to go from a major firm where everything is turnkey and one-stop shopping, essentially, to being a business owner where everything has to be built from scratch and pulled together on an a la carte basis. For those folks who know that they have outgrown the traditional brokerage world, that is the world of the big firms, but don't want to be a business owner, the quasi-independent space may be just the ticket. The only problem as I see it with it is that the name quasi-independent is about as unsexy as it gets and does little justice to the real sophistication of the model. Greg Fleming, ex-Morgan Stanley president, with the backing of Viking Global, has acquired Rockefeller Global a now $17 billion asset management firm and multifamily office. Greg's plan is to build a boutique wealth management unit from scratch, targeting private wealth management and PBIG, or private banking advisors, along with an advisory investment banking unit. While the firm is six months out from being ready for prime time, currently building out infrastructure and hiring rock star leadership, It's the best example of the quasi-independent model we're discussing today. So what is quasi-independence? It's essentially a newfangled and modern twist on RIAs, emblematic of how the industry landscape has expanded to address the changing needs of the advisor population at large. Generally, quasi-independent firms share the following characteristics. Their boutique shops, with W-2 models, meaning the advisors are employees. They offer aggressive recruiting deals, oftentimes a mix of cash and equity. They offer third-party custody with an institutional custodian like Schwab, Fidelity, Bank of New York, Pershing. So still offering the separation of safe asset custody, product manufacturing, and advice the very thing that defines what it means to be a fiduciary. They offer access to an amplified set of investment solutions because the firm can shop the street on behalf of the advisor, but also because the leadership of the firm has connectivity to a special curated solution set. Quasi-independents offer cutting-edge technology, and they offer strong balance sheets due to capital backing by either private equity or private investments from the owners and board members themselves. They offer the compliance and back office turnkey support that wirehouse advisors have come to depend upon. So essentially, these models allow advisors to replicate everything they're currently offering their clients from a product solution, service, human capital, and technology standpoint at absolutely no cost or detriment to the client. The less restrictive, more creative, and entrepreneurial environment ultimately then allows for a superior client service model. And of course, like in the case of Rockefeller and many others, the star power of the leadership team doesn't hurt either. The quasi-independent model isn't new. Hightower Advisors led the way with its partnership model, which no longer is in existence, but that was launched in 2008. The industry climate has been ripe for it to come into its own, that is, a quasi-independence 2.0, so to speak. 
So said another way, Hightower was born and proved that for the right model, advisors would leave the traditional brokerage space, even taking less money up front in order to gain the freedom, flexibility, and turnkey status of being independent. First Republic Wealth Management, William Blair, the Chicago-based mid-market investment bank, which has a wealth management unit, Snowden Lane, backed by Merrill's Lyle Lamoth and chaired by two ex-Merrill leaders, Crescent Wealth Advisors, the new kid on the block, co-founded by two of Chicago's top private equity executives, and Steward Partners, backed by Raymond James, are but a few examples of options in this category. So where is the hitch? It sounds almost too good to be true. Essentially, there is none except that most of these firms are newer, and so there's always the concern about their ability to gain traction, scale, execute on their plans, and get access to the capital they need for sustained growth. Still, many advisors come to the table simply because the names and stories are compelling. What they stand for, the notion of essentially being independent, but not having to deal with the heavy lifting of running a business can be appealing. But ultimately, many of those folks that come to the table run for the hills. It's the most open-minded of the lot that will join because they're looking for a ground floor opportunity to help shape and build a best-in-class firm. They're looking for early adopter, extra attractive economics, the opportunity to be a lightning rod, enticing other like-minded advisors who together can develop a stronger team environment and foster growth within this new culture. And they're looking for a highly customizable platform built to suit the needs of their high net worth clients best, one that is nimble enough, enabling them to grow their business with less limitations. The best news of all is that despite that many of them may be new, there's a safety net. So even in a worst case scenario, if the firm the advisor joins were to implode, the advisors and their clients are still protected because the safe asset custody with a multi-trillion dollar custodian and because the industry landscape has expanded to offer support and access to anything and everything that an independent advisor could need. What we're referencing here is the notion that if a firm imploded or didn't get off the ground, the advisor, just like many who left Hightower, who started in Hightower's partnership and subsequently left to go fully independent, the advisor could leave, unplug from the firm they joined, and plug themselves in directly to a custodian and other vendors that support them. The very definition of true open architecture means that an advisor accesses best-in-class solutions but is not beholden to any one of them. It's the ideal way, actually, for an advisor to plug in and then unplug from any and all solutions. For years, advisors in ultra-high net worth markets like Vail, Colorado, Santa Barbara, California, Short Hills, New Jersey, or Westchester, New York, have said If a boutique firm had interest in opening in my market, I'd be interested. So the reality is the time may very well have come for these folks because most of these quasi-independent boutique firms take the position that if a sexy enough advisor with the right book of business come along, they would build an open around them. And it seems as though almost every week, another one of these quasi-independent firms pops up, filling an important void in the industry landscape. While the names of these firms may be somewhat unfamiliar at the start, they all offer similar value propositions. The ability to gain equity plus a meaningful seat at the table to create something new and exciting. That is to build something bigger than one's own book of business. And that is the key thing to note the difference between independence and quasi-independence. In independence, an advisor is building his own equity, owns 100% of his own equity. In quasi-independent, the advisor believes that 
his equity plus the equity he is getting in the overall entity will ultimately be worth more to him in the end of the day. So for those feeling constricted by the big firms, but not quite entrepreneurial enough to go it alone as an independent, then quasi-independence could be a great option. In our next episode, We'll be speaking with a former Merrill Lynch advisor who, along with his multi-generational team, went independent under the umbrella of Focus Financial four years ago. Today, he looks back at what it was like moving with partners at different career stages, addressing the need for capital to solve for succession and the options they considered. We'll have a candid discussion about what it was like to get everyone on the same page and where they are now. So I hope you'll join us. Until then, I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for some valuable content. And if you're not already a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. You can always feel free to email or call me directly if you have any specific questions. I can be reached at 908 879-1002 or by email mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. I thank you for listening. I also want to thank wealthmanagement.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.